O oh God, since spiritual things are spiritually deserved, yes. let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. We were not here last week, but for the past two sermons, we have been exploring, learning, digging for pearls in one passage. Isaiah chapter 44, verses 1 to 8. The last time we, we, we studied, we left off where, where God said, I have chosen you. Which means, you are not a mistake. You are not here by mistake. You are not here by happenstance or some blind fate. God is saying to you about you, you are not driftwood on the sea of life, floating with the tide without rhyme or reason. And I know God is saying that to you because in the same verse, God says, I am the one who formed you from the womb. God said, I know you. I took note of you. I had a plan for your life before you were born. And there is not, this place, and there is not a single person in earth's seven or five billion people exactly like you. Not one. That's amazing. Seven or five billion. And even your fingerprint is unique to just you. Then God is saying, do you think after all that I will turn my back on you? Or not listen when you pray? Or know you when you cry out to me? When I knew you even before you were born. Then, then there are there were two compelling statements that we made in the course of our study so far that we should underscore and then we'll move on to more stuff today. But I just wanted to underscore this because there are some things if you take note and you go home and you 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 imbibe that you 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 let that sink into your subconscious it's going to change your life and these two statements you should note listen to it first one anything significant do you remember that statement anything significant that has ever been accomplished has been accomplished through what church Consistent what? Consistent action. And most times, should I note, most times the action is even not a momentous uh, action. It is not even something great. It may even be a relatively small action. But listen to me now. Done consistently with discipline. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Let's say you take a decision to do a 30-minute brisk walk every day. How often? Did I say once a week? We're talking about consistently. But here, here's a simple little decision that I'm going to take at least a 30-minute brisk walk every day. Sounds like a modest decision, but it's a life-changing one if done, how? Consistently. Okay, now that we, we have underscored that, that anything significant you have ever accomplished or will ever accomplish would be done through consistent action. The most significant thing you can accomplish in your life is to nurture a close relationship with God. That's the most important thing you can do in your life. Because if you've got a close relationship with God, everything will flow out of that. There is nothing greater that you can accomplish in life 
than in nurturing a close relationship with God. And the two absolutely necessary things you must do to accomplish nurturing that close relationship with God is prayer and you see how simple it is prayer and Bible study if you are to nurture a relationship with God you are to to focus on prayer and Bible study done how church once a week consistently consistently mm. that's why we have the Bible reading program by the way, it should be available to you today. It should have been available to you today. Was it handed out? It's here? Okay. Make sure you get the Bible reading for the month of November and follow it how church? Consistently. It looks like simple action. But I tell you, it's a significant action that will change your life. Okay. Right. So, all that God has said so far in the chapter, chapter 44, Isaiah 44, is actually overwhelming overwhelming in its intricate, individual, incredible, and indisputable care for our well-being. But being God, he gives us yet more. And that's what we're going to study now. He gives us yet more. Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 3. He says, I will do what church yeah help me preach i will do what i will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground i will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring i will pour water on him who is thirsty. Of course, this was... Did you hear, did you hear the language? I will pour water on, on what? On him who is thirsty. And I'm, I'm just making the point, this was written before our present day obsession with inclusive language. I just need to say language was never the problem. So if you want me to be politically correct, I will have to say, uh, God is saying, I will pour water on male and female and, and, and what you say the others? And what? No, I'm just forgetting the terms, the letters. I, I know it ends with GBT. God says, I will pour water. But God is saying, I will, he, God is saying, he's promising He's assuring that he will pour water on anyone who is thirsty. Let's put it that way. So, so my brain, my brain, when I read that, God, I will pour water on him who is thirsty, my brain immediately noted two things. The use of the word pour. Did you see that word there? That's what I noted. The use of the word poor and then on whom he is promising to pour the water. So, so let's look at those two points. Poor. P-O-U-R. You know where I went. Everybody tell me. Where did I go? Dictionary. So I went to the dictionary and looked at the word poor. And it says to pour is to cause to flow in a steady stream. Now hold on. Did you hear that? Do you hear how God blesses? How does he bless? How does he bless? Use what the, where, you, where you see consistently. Use the word on the screen. <laughs> In a steady stream. How does God bless? He blesses in a steady stream. Not drip, drip. In a steady stream. 
Not on today and off tomorrow. No, no. That's how we are. Depending on our mood or emotions. On today and off tomorrow. Depending on uh, how we feel on that day. The, based on our own perceptions or the situation. But God says he blesses in a steady stream because he says, I am God, I change not. So, <laughs> follow me. God says he would bless how? In a steady stream. Not off and on. So if you are not experiencing the steady stream of God's blessing, what's happening then? <laughs> you should ask yourself that question because please keep this in mind. God says he will bless in a steady stream. Right? And you are saying to me, well, I am not experiencing the steady, steady stream. I am saying today, if you are not experiencing the steady stream, it's one out of three things. And you should be asking, what are they? I am glad you asked. <laughs> Number one, you have blocked off the stream. Because God says he will bless in a steady stream. If you are not experiencing the stream, you have blocked off the stream. Ladies and gentlemen, my Christian friends, there are things you can do that will block the stream. There are behaviors you can indulge in that will obstruct the stream of God's blessings. There are attitudes you can adopt that will hinder the stream. So instead of blaming God when the blessings stop flowing or it's trickling in inadequate stumble, check for blockages in your life. And if you won't blame me for keeping you too long, I would have gone into detail in what some of those blockages could be. But I don't have the time. I'm just saying, you check. What it is, God is saying he's going to bless me in a steady stream. And I'm not experiencing that stream. So something in my life is blocking the stream. And if you can't find it, that's why I'm here as a pastor. Make an arrange, uh, 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 arrangement with me. We'll meet in my office and together we could explore what might be blocking the stream. But, so, so you're blocking the stream. How many ways I say? If you're not, oh, three, okay. The second way in which you may not experiencing the steady stream is by looking for it to flow in a particular way or in a specific direction. You think you got that? So the stream is flowing, but you're not, ex, uh, you're not experiencing it because you are looking in a direction that it's not flowing. You see, God promises that he will pour water on anyone who is thirsty. So in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your difficulty, in the midst of your pain, he is still pouring but you may not be benefiting because you turn away from the stream and now you are focusing on the stress in your life. That's what you are focusing on. Oh, it's these stories that make my sermon long. Something came to my mind and if it comes to my mind when I'm preaching, who you think is suggesting that? So who am I to say, no, I need to send them home two minutes early. Okay, good. I'm saying, I'm saying, you, you, the stream is flowing, but you are not, you are looking in a different direction, so you're not experiencing it. Let me tell you what something that happened to someone. He had this bad habit of driving without his seatbelt. He knew he should put on his seatbelt, he never did. 
He would go in the car and it's on me, but I'm just saying that I have this habit of never putting on the seat belt to start off. I get in my car and get everything ready and I, I move off. And while I am the first few feet, then I put on my seat. And my wife is always telling me, you, you see it better? I say, yeah, I know, I'm, I'll put it on. But, okay, but this guy never did. One day, he was crabbed, and usually no seat belt. Police flagged him down and gave him a hefty fine. He was mad. He was mad with anger and disgust. And he knew he should, but he did, still didn't. He had to pay the fine. Wait, he hadn't even paid the fine yet. The next day, the next day, he was driving. Guess how? With his seat belt on. Because he got the fine. He was driving at a pretty, pretty fast rate. He rounded a blind corner, and a car was coming towards him on the wrong side of the road, or too much on his side. And there was a head-on collision. He woke up in the hospital, seriously injured. And the doctors and the police said to him, you would have been dead without your seatbelt. Yeah. Oh, do you understand what's happening here? Yes. He said he would have been dead. He said if he had not been charged the day before, he would have been a dead man. And he was fussing and being angry. He said, man, I paid that fine with a smile on my face. So, so, so when he thought he was going through a hard and difficult time and was angry and, and, and fussing, God was blessing him by allowing the police to charge him. Sometimes God is blessing us, but we are not looking in the right direction. So that's what the, the second reason. So, so you, should, you should make sure. And one of the ways in which you can enjoy the free-flowing river of grace, even on dark days, is by approaching another, uh, uh, appropriating, sorry, another admonition given in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. And the Bible says there, give thanks in all circumstances. Hey, hey, hold on. Did I read that right? Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. What is the will of you? That you fast when things go wrong? Yeah, you're, you're not answering. I said, what is God's will for you? That you fast when things go wrong in your life? Give thanks. So hear me now. So the Bible says, give thanks for all circumstances. Amen? I just messed you up and you didn't know. The Bible didn't say that. I changed a word that changed everything. The word of God didn't say, give thanks for all circumstances. Because all circumstances are not pleasant and not good. So, it's not give thanks for all circumstances. God says, give thanks in all circumstances. No matter where you find yourself, no matter what's happening, there is something you can praise God for. Amen? So, for example, they, um, you lose your phone, and you're fussing, and you, you, you're being stressed out. Your phone, you've lost your phone. Hey, give thanks in all circumstances. I know some people have lost their lives and they ain't say a word. But you, you fussing because you lost your phone. Uh-huh. You see what I'm saying? Thank God it's just your phone you lost. Give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks. In all circumstances. Did I say it has to make logical sense? 
to give thanks when you are down in a dark day? It may not, but God is telling you, God is sharing with you how to keep this water pouring into your life in a steady stream. And he says, stop stressing yourself out and fussing when, when things happen that you cannot change, when circumstances are not working out. He says, give thanks anyhow. And immediately you start to give thanks. What you, you need to do then is look for things, even in the situation you give God thanks for. It changes your perspective and you start to feel better. And all of a sudden, the situation is handled and taken care of. The songwriter said, mercy drops round us are falling. You know that song? Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. The mercy drops are not God's doing. God don't do drops. Just telling you. God don't do drops. He dispenses and distributes blessings with a heavy hand. Good measure. Another Bible writer says. Good measure. Press down. Shaken together. And running over. That's how God blesses. I will pour water on anyone who is thirsty. Hey, when the Israelites got thirsty while crossing a burning desert, God told Moses, take your rod and strike the rock over there and I will provide water for the people. That's in Exodus chapter 17 and verse 6. And it was so. Do you think the water came in drips and drabs? Do you know how many people had to drink? Well, the Bible says the crowd was made up of 600,000 men. And when I checked into that, it meant 600,000 able-bodied military-aged men. And when you add to that women and children, the estimate was that there were some 2.4 million people marching through the desert. And God told Moses, take your rod, strike that rock. And when he struck that rock, water gushed out in such crazy torrents that over 2 million people had enough to drink. That's how God blesses. He said, I will Pour water on anyone who is thirsty. How many reasons I said, if you're not getting the steady stream? Three. One more. I, I, I didn't say one more to end the sermon. I said one more just for this section. Okay. Okay. Third, third reason. Why you may not be experiencing the flow. The first two, the water is flowing, but you're not getting it. The blessings are flowing from God but there's some blockage in your life or you are looking in different direction, right? That's the first two. In this last one, the water has stopped flowing. I, I just remembered something I need to, 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 to just give you an illustration uh, so that you, you won't forget in this uh, looking in a different direction and the water is flowing. You, you, you get up Sabbath morning and you need to come to church. What's one of the first things you need to do? I mean, apart from your devotion, what's the first thing you need to do? Eh? And I say apart from your devotion. You have your devotion. After next, what, what next? You don't know? I hope you know you should take a shower. <laughs> okay, so you go, <laughs> you go and you turn on the shower, right? You turn it on. What's the next thing you need to do? Because the water is flowing, everything is all right with it. Huh? No, you, you, you stretch your hand and you turn on the shower. What's the next thing you need to do? You need to go under the water. Is the water flowing? Could you imagine somebody stand outside the thing and say, Hey, but um, I'm not... 
this, this is not working. There's, I'm not benefiting from this water. Hey, stand under the shower. You understand what I'm saying? You have to step into the shower and, and what, the water can't be flowing there and you stand up here and expect to get the blessings. You have to step under the shower. Just in case you didn't know. And then you will start to benefit. So uh, there are way, you, what, what I'm saying is, God says you will continually pour, but you have to position yourself to benefit from the flow. That is so deep, I want to say it again. Because some of you are not experiencing the steady flow of God's blessing. I am saying, you, you've got to position yourself to benefit from the flow. Because it's not God's fault that the water of blessings is not flowing. You, you have not positioned yourself. Well, let me give you some examples of positioning yourself. When you come to, every time you dress and you come to church, you are positioning yourself. You stay home in bed because you're a little bit tired. You are not positioning yourself. Because say, God says, don't forsake the assembling of yourself. Hey, but can't God bless me home? Oh, no. So he must pour. No, he said, position yourself. When you, when you obey God, when you be faithful to God in tithes and offerings, you are positioning yourself for the blessing. That's a special one because no, note the word. Note the word. Listen to this. Malachi. The Bible says, bring ye all the tithes into the stalls and prove me now here with said the Lord. If I will not do what? Open the windows and, and, and do what? <laughs> here is the same word and pour you out a blessing so you you there want the blessings of God to flow in your life but you're not positioning yourself because you say hey things are hard I am not giving no 10% you're cutting off the blessings and you're not realizing it I wish I could tell you stories of what God has done in our lives my wife and I by, by being faithful to him in that because you've got to position yourself. Okay, right. Now let's go. The, the third one. The, the, the third one, the flow has stopped. Now, I will pour water on anyone who is thirsty. The answer is there. I will pour water on anyone who is thirsty. There's a vital, listen to me now. There's a vital secret here in accessing the lavish hand of God. Some of you have picked it up already, but don't miss it. Miss it. Look at it. There's it. What is it? Huh? Thirsty. On whom will God pour water? No, no, no. Some people said anyone. <laughs> okay. Watch it. I will pour water on anyone, full stop. Is that what the Bible says there? Eh? So don't tell me on whom God will pour anyone. After anyone is not a full stop. God says, he describes the anyone. I will pour water on anyone who is what church? Thirsty. You've got to come thirsty. You've got to come hungry. You've got to feel your need. Listen to me, my people. God doesn't pour water on anyone who isn't thirsty. God doesn't feed anyone who isn't hungry. So some of you are missing out on the signal blessings of God because you are doing too well. So you feel you have need of nothing. And you don't even know. The Bible says that you are poor and wretched and blind and naked. Could you imagine a person naked and don't know it? What do you call such a person? You're mad. God says, when you think you could handle your life on your own and you don't need me, you don't understand the condition you are in. You're not mentally sound because you're blind and you're wretched and you're poor and you're naked and you don't even know it. 
You're not hungry for God. As one, one friend of mine said, I'm just quoting him. I don't even know if this word is okay or not. He said to me, when a Negro has food in his belly and some money in the bank and he's not in pain in his body, church and God and spiritual things come way down his priority list. And even though, listen to this, even though he may pray or come to church, there is no thirst. There is no hunger. And so he comes and goes with no change in his or her life. Because there are some blessings God only pours into thirsty vessels. No wonder the word of God says in another place, you've got to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And then you will be filled. To understand this thing, what God is saying, have you ever sat Set a meal before someone who isn't hungry. Try it. Someone who isn't hungry and you take time and prepare a meal. And they're not hungry. So they'll, oh, I, I, I don't eat that. Or oh, 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 what is that over there? Oh, I don't like how this looks because they aren't hungry. Have you ever offered water to someone who isn't thirsty? They turn up their nose at you. You've got to come thirsty. You've got to come hungry. That's a prerequisite for the blessings of God on your life. That's the curse of the modern day church. We have a church Full of, I'm not talking about beacon lights, I'm about the uh, we, we have a church full of people who don't know what it is to be hungry and thirsty for God. And so we are never filled. The curse of casual worshippers. No fervor, no zeal, just lukewarm. I don't believe the great God of heaven said that, but it could be rough sometimes because to wake us up. He says, you, you look what you make me sick. He says, I wish you were cold or hot. You, you just look warm. I'll spew you out of my mouth. You make me sick. You just come to church and you're just casual. No hunger for God. But I need to send you home. Lower in verse 3. He said, I will pour my water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. What else? I will pour my spirit on your descendants, that's your children, and my blessing on your offspring. I will pour what? My spirit. We need to hunger for the spirit of God in our lives. I remember that song we used to sing. Fill me now, fill me now. Jesus, come and fill me now. Fill me with your hallowed presence. Come, oh come and fill me now. A hunger. Listen to what this inspired writer Ellen G. White says. She says, listen to this. The Holy Spirit will come to all who are what? Begging. Who begs? A person who have all they want? A person in need. She says the Holy Spirit will come to all who are begging for the bread of life. This promised blessing claimed by faith brings all other blessings in its train. I wish I had time. So... One of the soul hunger. We, we need to ask God. Lord make me hungry. For your, the infilling of your Holy Spirit. Because as natural normal human beings. We don't have a natural inclination. To hunger for spiritual things. Oh yes material stuff. Oh yeah we go after that. But when it comes to spiritual things. We need to ask God. 
give, give us a hunger. Help us to feel the need so that we can come to you hungry. Because when we come hungry and thirsty, he fills us. Verse 6. I know I should do verses 1 to 8, but we'll take three months. So uh, I skip some stuff. Verse 6. God says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am what? I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. When, when I read that, I went, it, it took me right back to my childhood. Oh yes, I'm this age, but I did have a childhood. Yeah, I was young once. I was a little boy once. once. <laughs> right. I am the first, and I am the last. You see, when, when I was a child... Uh, and we, we were going anywhere as a group, and it's dark and scary. Because I didn't grow up in the city. I grew up in the country. And at one point, my, my dad was giving us the experience of taking care of animals. And, take, and as children, we, we were six of us. Uh, my, I was a fourth. And uh, the, we would run around during the day, and we would, ev we would have to go and tie out the goat. You, you, all, you all don't even know about that. You, you need to go and tie out the goat in a nice pasture where it could get to. Uh, and we would play and so on and forget about the goat. And it would be tied out there. And night would come. And then our dad would say, um, okay, um, where's the goat? And he'd say, oh. And he was so wicked. Well, not wicked, he... Discipline. He'd say, well, you, will, you all have to go for it. In the dark. In the dark. And Segla, where I grew up, you didn't have street lights. Out in the dark. And we would all crowd together. So I'm saying, when we're going and we're scary, I never wanted to be out front, leading, because... That's fronting the danger. If you're out front, you'll be the first to be attacked. I also never wanted to be last. Bringing up the rear was also dangerous because the last one can easily be taken. I see a dangerous situation in the world with soldiers and so on, where they are marching and so on, and the guy in the back is dead, and they don't even know it. You understand what I'm saying? He's taken his shot because he last. Never wanted to be last. I always wanted to be somewhere in the middle, which was the safest, since you would be protected front and back. And I'm thinking, hey, this is what God is saying. In life, in life, you face dangerous situations physically, emotionally or even spiritually and you wish you always had someone watching your back that would be great hey but that leaves your front it leaves you fronting the challenge can you always have someone going in before you or going out ahead of you Facing the danger, meeting the challenge? Well, you do. But could you have somebody also fronting the challenge and watching your back at the same time? Thank God we do. His name is Jesus. He says, I am the first and I am the last. Then he adds, besides me, there is no God. And he added that, besides me, there is no God, because it's only God who can watch your back and at the same time face down the danger for you. I am the first and I am the last. He has even gone ahead of us, facing down death, allowing himself to be captured, going down into the grave, and then bursting out in his resurrection power. That's why... Death holds no massive fear for the follower of Jesus Christ. I am the first and I am the last. Even deeper than this earthly parallel. More profound than the temporal and mortal concerns. 
He is the first and last of a kind. That's what he's saying. I'm first and last of a kind. Jesus Christ is the only God man. The only being in God's universe to be fully God and fully man. At the same time, as God, he can grasp the door of the heaven of heavens. And as man, he can at the same time grasp the hand of fallen humanity and pull them up to where he is in glory. The first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. That is not a boast. That is a simple statement of fact. Two minutes and I send you home. Verse 8. He said, do not tremble. Do not be afraid. We dealt with that, didn't we? There are things we will meet, church people. Situations that will imperceptibly creep upon us. Or blindside us with the abrupt manifestation. We are living in a world where horror stalks the land and human wickedness knows no bounds. And to use biblical terminology, men's hearts are failing them for fear. It is in the midst of all this when the natural reaction and overwhelming emotion would be to tremble and fear that God says to us, his people, do not tremble, do not be afraid. But why? Why would we be able to resist the natural human survival instinct to fear and tremble? He tells us right here in the te text. He says, did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. God is telling us, my friends, we need not tremble and fear because one, we have a God who foretells the future. In other words, we know what's coming. We know how the story ends. We know who wins the game. And secondly, we have a rock on which to stand all other ground is sinking sand he says you do not fear would things happen in your life that would cause you to fear oh yes but he says do not fear because I am with you I am your rock without God you need to fear what's happening in our world today you need to fear but with God he says do not tremble and do not fear. Why? Because we have a rock in Christ Jesus. This is why I chose as a closing hymn, number 522. 522. Listen to what it says. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name.